<laughs> Suppose I asked you to rank five quarterbacks from last year, but all I gave you to go off of was their passer ratings. What would you do? After trying to Jimmy Neutron brain blast your way to remembering which of these numbers connect to specific guys, I think your only option would be to line them up from largest to smallest. But by doing so, you would have ranked Jake Browning as the best quarterback. And then after supposedly asking you this question, I'd supposedly look at your rankings and say, you really think Jake Browning and Russell Wilson were better than Jordan Love and Patrick Mahomes last year? having set you up like a third grader telling you to spell I-cup. See, I was able to manufacture this situation all because of... Takeaway number one. Passer rating is not quarterback rating. You often hear passer rating and quarterback rating used interchangeably. I'm guilty of it myself. I think this is because saying quarterback rating can feel more authoritative and natural, while passer rating can feel like when commentators and writers start calling the QB a third year signal caller. But the problem is, is it's disingenuous to call it a quarterback rating because quarterbacks, especially in today's NFL, do so much more than just pass the ball. The passer rating metric, though, is concerned only with five variables. Pass attempts, completions, yards, touchdown passes, and interceptions. The calculation itself breaks out into four parts, which are then added together, divided by six, and then multiplied by 100 to get a player's passer rating. Part A is completions divided by attempts, minus 0.3, and then multiplied by 5. Part B is passing yards divided by attempts, minus 3, and then multiplied by 0.25. Part C is touchdown passes divided by attempts and then multiplied by 20. And Part D is to take interceptions divided by attempts, multiplied by 25, and subtract that value from 2.375. The maximum rating you can receive is a 158.3, a nice and easy to remember natural number, while the minimum rating is zero. The reason for the maximum and minimum ratings is because if any part of the equation goes above 2.375, it is set back to that max, and if any part goes negative, it is set back to zero. We'll get more into why a little later in the video. But for now, let's calculate Patrick Mahomes' passer rating from the Super Bowl. Starting with part A, we'll take his completions, 34, and divide it by his attempts, 46, to get 0.7391. We'll subtract 0.3 from that to get 0.439, and then multiply it by 5 for 2.1956. Next, we'll take his passing yards, 333, and divide that by 46 to get 7.239. Subtract 3 from that and get 4.239, and then multiply that by 0.25 to get 1.059 for part B. For part C, we'll take his two touchdown passes and divide it by 46 again to get 0.0434. We'll multiply that by 20 and we'll finish with 0.869. And finally, for part D, we'll take his one interception and divide it by 46 to get 0.0217 and then multiply that by 25 for 0.5434. Then we'll subtract that value from 2.375 to get 1.8316. Now we'll add together parts A, B, C, and D to get 5.9551. We'll then divide this number by 6 to get 0 0.9925. And finally, we'll just multiply this by 100 and give a charitable roundup for the Super Bowl winning quarterback and get a 99.3 passer rating. Between 0 and 158.3, a 99.3 rate is more than solid, but by the very nature of the variables, this rating can't take into account one of his most impactful plays of the whole game, a 22-yard rush off read option in the middle of the third quarter that helped finally take the lid off Kansas City's offense. And that's why it's important to remember... Takeaway number 2 what goes into passer rating is just as important as what doesn't. It should probably come as no surprise that rushing stats aren't considered for passer rating. I mean, it's called passer rating. But there are aspects to the passing game overall that the rating doesn't account for either. 
The Hidden Game of Football, a book from the late 80s by Bob Carroll, Pete Palmer, and John Thorne that deep dives on NFL statistics that I can't recommend enough, has a section dedicated to the advent of passer rating. They write, No one ever thinks of it this way, but the passer rating system is really a yards per attempt formula with bonuses for completions and touchdown passes and penalties for interceptions. And the more you think about it, the more you realize what all is being left out. Among the things not being considered are sacks, how open the receivers are, how much pressure the quarterback is under, both literally and figuratively, down and distance, drop passes, throwaways, yards after the catch, and depth of incompletions. That last one in particular was interesting to me. That passer rating only considers how many yards a completed pass resulted in rather than, say, having some way to weigh passes at different lengths. As it stands now, a passer will receive the same penalty for a ball that goes through a player's hands 30 yards downfield as they will for whiffing on an open 5-yard slant. This leads perfectly into... Takeaway number 3. Passer rating can cheat you, and you can cheat passer rating. Passer rating has plenty of limitations, but the players who are most affected by them might be those hanging out in the extremes. Consider Joe Namath's performance in Week 6 of 1967 and Jared Goff's from Week 4 of 2018. If I asked you who had the better performance in these games but only gave you their passer rating, you wouldn't be able to base your answer off anything except vibes. Both guys received a perfect 158.3 passer rating. When we uncover the stats behind those overall ratings, it becomes much easier to argue that Goff had the more impressive day throwing the ball. He ended with 26 completions on 33 passes for 465 yards and 5 touchdowns, compared to Namath's 13 completions on 15 attempts for 199 yards and 2 touchdowns. And yet, both left the stadium with the same rating. The same thing happens at the opposite end of the scale too, like with Ryan Leaf in Week 3 of 1998 and Jeff Garcia in Week 2 of 2004. Both guys received 0.0, .0 passer ratings for their performances in these games, but at first glance, you may not guess that based on their stat lines. Yes, a 1 for 15 game for 4 yards and 2 picks is little brother on all Madden bad, and yes, a 8 for 27 day for 71 yards and 3 picks is throw up in your mouth disgusting, but I think they are different types of bad. Garcia, at the very least, had some production through the air. But I'd be curious to know which of these quarterback performances you'd sign up for to give your team the best chance to steal a win. It's actually kind of a fun game to play. Boot up Stathead, filter for all of the zero passer rating games in history, and see which stat lines you think you could still live with your QB giving. The last quarterback to start and finish a game with a rating of zero and still win was Norm Sneed in week 10 of the 1976 season. He completed just 3 of his 14 attempts for 26 yards, 2 interceptions, and no touchdowns as his New York Giants beat the Washington Redskins 12-9. But the reason why you can have so much variance at the opposite ends of the passer rating scale is because of the fact that no number in the equation can be greater than 2.375 or less than 0. These artificial caps then mean there are both minimum requirements to get a perfect 158.3 rating and thresholds you must cross to start scoring above a zero. A perfect rating requires at least a 77.5% completion percentage, 12.5 passing yards per attempt, an 11.875% touchdown to attempt ratio, and zero interceptions. A minimum rating of zero requires, at best, a 30% completion percentage, 3 yards per attempt, zero touchdowns, and a 9.5% interception to attempt ratio. If a player was well versed in the calculation and really wanted a perfect passer rating more than anything else, he may be inclined to throw a screen pass into the dirt to bring their completion percentage down to 78, rather than risk the receiver getting tackled early to bring his average yards per attempt below 12.5. And this is exactly my biggest criticism with passer rating. It can't account for the context in which the pass was attempted. Because football is so situational, with down and distance, field position, time left, whatever, this becomes one of its biggest flaws. 
The hidden game of football makes the same point and argues there is too much value placed on simply completing passes. They lay out a scenario between two quarterbacks, Joe Accurate and Danny Baum, to prove their point. Joe Accurate starts the first drive of the game by completing three passes in a row, each for exactly three yards. Then, on fourth and one, his team punts the ball to Danny Baum, who takes over and throws his first two passes into the turf. But then, on his third attempt, he hits a long one for 48 yards. Danny and his team are in opponent territory with a first down. Now, which passer has the higher rating after three passes? Joe Accurate, 69 to 68. Passer rating essentially views passes inside a vacuum. And while I think this is a benefit in some circumstances since it helps maintain consistency and rating behind cold numbers rather than emotion behind a performance, the lack of context should make you take the rating with a grain of salt, especially with smaller sample sizes. Another reason to take it with a grain of salt is because... Takeaway number 4. Passer rating was created when NFL passing looked different. Passer rating was invented in 1971, which is funny because I had just assumed that for as long as people roamed the earth, passer rating was being calculated. But no, it came out just before Pong was released. Before passer rating hit the shelves, the league tried a couple different methods to crown a passing champion. From 1932 to 1937, they used just straight passing yardage. From 1938 to 1940, accuracy became all the rage, so they used completion percentage. From 1950 to 1959, they used average gain per pass, which of course had its issues as six of the ten passing champs threw fewer than 200 times during that era. And then from 1960 up to 1971, the league experimented with a variety of inverse scoring systems and tried tweaking which stats were part of the system. Finally, the NFL commissioner at the time, Pete Rozelle, asked Don Smith and Seymour Seoff of the Elias Sports Bureau to develop a better system for ranking the different passers in the league. Their solution was passer rating, and the NFL officially adopted the system in 73. To create it, they scoured data from 1960 to 1970 and tried to make a metric that would rate players' performance accordingly based on that decade of seasons. As the Hidden Game of Football says, they determined that the average passer completed 50% of his passes, threw 5 touchdowns for every 100 passes, had 11 out of every 200 tosses intercepted, and gained 7 yards per attempt on average. The idea was to reward guys more or less points for how they performed relative to that scale. And when the system was first unveiled, a 66.6 .6 rating was considered average while a rating of 100 plus was considered fantastic. Of course, we know football, and especially the quarterback position, has evolved a lot since the 60s, the decade in which the rating system is based off. Today, the rules of the game and arm talent of the players have developed in a way to make passing more potent than ever. Remember that 66.6 .6 average rating? During the first decade of passer ratings, 1973 to 1983, the average rating among all passers was 67.8. Over the last 10 years though, that average is now 90.1. This doesn't mean that passer rating is an obsolete metric, but it may be a bit of a relic to a slightly different era of football. When it was first being developed, it seemed like the problem the creators wanted to solve was how to have a metric that could easily compare passers between seasons and eras with a fixed scale. I think they got really close to doing that, but with how much the rating has consistently improved over the past 50 years, it seems like they didn't account for where the game would be at today, which, no shade there, trying to actually achieve a timeless metric sounds next to impossible. So, with all this in mind, let's talk about Takeaway number 5. Passer rating is a good summary, but it shouldn't be all you go off. Like with almost every stat in football, passer rating needs to be combined with some knowledge of what is actually happening on the field to be completely useful. With its limitations and how some of the variables interact with each other, it's probably best used for a whole season or more of data rather than in small samples. And while it's pretty intuitive, it's still important to not let the interchanging of quarterback rating and passer rating confuse you over what all the calculation actually entails. On the question of whether you can trust passer rating, 
I think the blanket answer is yes. It's not perfect by any means, but if you're using it as a way to see how a guy is performing strictly as a passer relative to other quarterbacks or to himself season over season, I think it can give you a good encapsulation of that extremely quickly. Just remember, it is not the same as an overall quarterback rating. What goes into it can be just as important as what doesn't. The variables can be manipulated, and it was invented during a time when passing looked much different. And what do you know? Those just happen to be the takeaways outlined in this video. Pretty cool. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please remember to give it a like if you did enjoy it and consider subscribing to the channel so you can catch the next one. Thanks. Bye.